targets or something? Yeah, they do that. There's like, there's drone racing league, and um, a lot of those it's like first person view. So, um, you know, most hobbyists in the U.S. like you're not allowed to use anything that blocks your vision. Um, so you have to go to like certain areas, or um, and so the easiest way to do it is just a simulator. And I, I tried it, and it's uh, just like on your computer, and you have the same. You can plug in a similar controller, um, and it is just wicked hard. Things, I mean, they move fast. So uh, one of the Drix guys had a little. Uh, it's the I think the seventy millimeter one, mm. and. Um, he was flying that all over the ship. Oh, yeah. Like, you'd be working in the hangar, and the drone would come in there, and um, it would fly around the ROV at waist level. Oh, my gosh. And you'd hear this, <laughs> and it'd be gone again, and then five seconds later, it'd come back through and do another lap. <laughs> it was like flying it down the hall and then around through the wet lab, and, or, and then you know back out and down into the data lab. And Did it have propeller guards? Yeah, okay, yeah, it would, it would totally like bounce against the walls. Like if it came by you and you, the idea was to try and swat it out of the air, he encouraged. Like he was showing us video, he'd play it around it at home and he's he's got a big shop and um, he's got all these LED hoops set up everywhere in the shop. But then outside his, his uh, wife and his kids were unloading some stuff out of the car and it came close to his wife and she just like, <laughs> knocked it down on the ground and then it, it landed right enough he just took off again and kept going <laughs> he's doing all that with goggles on it's amazing wow oh yeah, yeah. so those are those first person goggles yeah he's wearing yeah. FPV like goggles oh. yeah they're like an oculus type of thing yeah. that'll be the next generation of rov you're gonna have a, the oculus headset <laughs> it's uh it's been tried several times over the years with the 3d and the, uh, especially for operating the manipulators it hasn't, uh, hasn't stuck yet. Oh, I do have a question about, um, uh, let's see. Would it be advantageous for the ROV team to have s s scripts that make the arm go to places that are super common? So for instance, like you, you're you always gonna wanna pull the Niskin bottles. And yeah. the position and distance they're not really going to change much so i've thought about that but i mean even like the niskin bottles right those um little ribbons do flap in the wind and move um i mean there's all kinds of times that right we'll pick up a rock and go go back somewhere but you know if depending on the grip there's sometimes we're parked near like a kind of a wall of boulders and you got to tilt further up than i normally would or um that's a, so that, this arm actually has that capability built into the controller. Uh, but there is, um, and some of the commercial um, vehicles as well as some of the Woods Hole vehicles have that capability. Okay. Yeah, and um, you can also operate the arm, there's a Cartesian controller, so you can do X, Y, Z and, you know, translation and rotation. Uh, but the biggest challenge, uh, which the new the, the new Schilling vehicle, the Gemini system, is is overcoming, is you have um, two two things that are six degrees of freedom, right? You have an ROV that pitches and rolls and rotates, and um, then you have an arm with six degrees of freedom. So when you're operating both at the same time, you have twelve degrees of freedom. You're trying to oh, to the do math gets kind of. It gets a little complicated, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the Gemini system is solving that with, they're actually using um, the air in the PID loop to um, soften up some of the functions in X, Y, and Z. But then um, I think the Gemini system is incorporating a machine vision uh, fiducials and um, and the operator as well. So the uh, you basically, but the advantage that they have is they operate in more of a known environment. So the uh, the vehicle, if it's going to go down and work on a structure, a structure, for example, say a, 
a, man a subsea manifold, and they consist of a lot of valves and controls and places where you plug things in with the ROV to give it hydraulic power. So all that is preloaded into the ROV, so it, it knows that. And then when it when it flies up, it, it sees the sees that, recognizes it, and knows where it is. And it also um, it can come in up and grab a hold and basically dock in. But um, the new e vehicle was doing uh, some of that. They actually had someone on the beach uh, with a VR headset on operating it. The manipulator on Newey in uh, VR was pretty cool. Wow. With a massive delay. Massive was, delay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah it was, it was, uh, he, he did it for a few minutes and said, yeah, this, we can do it, but yeah. yeah. Interesting. So that, more interesting part of Newey, at least for me, was they had a guy who basically used, pre, the, he did a, a 3D map of the seafloor and then somebody could say, okay, here, I'm using this 3D map of the, of the seafloor and pre-program moves using that. So it didn't have to be in real time, but then he could go ahead and grab things. And I see, yeah, yeah. When you get here, do this kind right. of thing, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But they did, uh, they, I think they did a core sample as well. So the Oh, that, that's why I thought about this, because the push yeah. core is a very specific thing. And I was like, how useful right. would it be to just have a script and say, um, I would want to go here, please. Yeah. Put the arm of this configuration. It's um, it's interesting. Like uh, with um, a lot of the vehicles out there are have shilling manipulators on them, and those manipulators are used also extensively in the nuclear and defense industry, where they're um, used in the Cartesian control. There's no teleoperation, right? It's all and um but it it's never taken off in the in the ROV side so the same manipulators being used to uh go up inside of a nuclear reactor and you know do repairs on uh cooling tubes and stuff like that damn uh same exact manipulator that's used on an ROV but it, it's teleoperated exclusively teleoperated on a vehicle the most I've seen them do is they have a pre-programmed uh, deploy stow routine. So you press a button on the controller and it brings the manipulator out to a predetermined position and then you can tell the operate. And then when you're right. done, you put it back close to there and it parts Stows. itself. Yeah, right, yeah. 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 Which is uh, what you taught me to do without the cameras in about a day of practice. So. Yeah. yeah, most operators that like to they operate that's kind of what we do uh, so. but that is that is coming and the Gemini system is um, got two giant very smart manipulators on there but it also has a lot of processing power so it's several factors of you know it's a big Unix boxes running that in general, right, the more you know about your environment and the more standard the routines the easier it's going to be to automate Right, yeah. For those nuclear environments, do they have to have like any kind of radiation hardening for the electronics, or are yeah, they radiation absolutely. hardened? Yeah, yeah. They have all TEF cell wires in them, and um, uh, I think the boards, for the most part, are you know they're not they're not that smoking hot like the um, like the Sunfish mm. vehicles they've used to go into the Fukushima reactor. Oh, was that First, sunfish? Uh, it was a different sunfish, but they named their little guy sunfish, which mm. is interesting. But the first, uh, the first couple succumbed to the radiation. Uh, mm. The mm -hmm. robot. Yeah. Had a fatal. Uh, it basically died, cooked itself to death. But the level of radiation there is is huge compared yeah. to what you're doing if you're doing maintenance on a on a working reactor or doing the, um, the other thing they're used in extensively is uh, decommissioning so taking apart old old reactors or cleaning up uh, waste at Hanford or Oak Ridge or some of the other sites around the planet yeah. that are 
or human can't go. Do you know some of those stone aerospace folks? What's that? The stone aerospace folks that make the other sunfish? No, uh-uh, no. I've checked it out and read about it. It's pretty interesting. So. Yeah, so that was the, um, that deployment up in Michigan that I was working on. We had two of their folks, like, contracted to just help, uh, help with some of the field logistics. And they were uh -huh. both great. Right here. <laughs> oh, oops. <laughs> Didn't mute myself. Uh, Dan, earlier when you said that uh, the commercial vehicles that plug into hydraulics, is did you mean like they also get hydraulic power from a site rather than a generator on board? No, they're supplying hydraulic power to operate functions on subsea equipment. Oh, the vehicle supplies the hydro... Yeah, oh, wow. correct. Yeah. Okay. Like what? Uh, when you're doing uh, subsea construction, if you're landing, um, so say you have a manifold and you have like a bunch of satellite wells and those are going to manifolds and those manifolds are going to other manifolds. Um, so the all of that stuff has um, secondary functionality that can be operated uh, remotely with an ROV. But when you're building all that stuff, putting it together, it's it's rather large stuff that has to be lowered down on a crane. So to to make the connections, the seals, and what they call jumpers between all those is an example. So you're you're basically actuating a big hydraulic clamp, and that brings a seal in and and makes a seal. But they also use uh, subsea tooling that gets plugged in. So you bring like a saw down or a grinder or something like that. It's, it's tooling that uh, you change out on the fly. So it's lowered down with a crane and a basket. You go over with the ROV and grab it up and plug it in. And then when you're done with it, you unplug it and put it back in the basket. Goes back up to the vessel. And then also, um, when they're uh, torquing things down, you're inserting a big torque tool. And it's basically a bucket you stick it into, and it's um, basically, you know, opening and closing the valve or pulling the, pulling a connection in for an umbilical for the controls. So all the controls are remote through big umbilicals and they have electrical and hydraulic connections in them. The term in the old days is a um, hot stab. It's basically like the QDs that we plug into Hercules, mm. but it's a it's a long stainless steel shaft with ports and O-rings in it, and you plug that into a receptacle, and the the vehicle has an auxiliary hydraulic power unit that is used exclusively for that, and then they also pump uh, lots of different fluids to do remediation or fill stuff up or. We've also been a little lower tech where we have uh, tools that divers use mm. and some hoses figurated on the side of the ROV. So we're basically <laughs> a flying hydraulic power unit. So the sat divers use us. So we fly down and land and sat diver walks up and grabs a big rattle gun off the side of the vehicle with hoses and drags it over and <laughs> flanches up a pipe or connector, something like that. Those divers like stay in a little thing, right? They uh, 
they live on board in um, in uh, yeah pressurized environment, and then they they go down for a twelve hour shift, usually two divers in a bell, so the bell yeah detach uh, detaches from the saturation chamber and slower down, and then they come out of the bottom of the bell and do some work. One diver stays inside and tends the hoses and the uh, gases that the the guy who's out working gets, and then they they rotate out. Yeah, they stay in the sat chambers for weeks. That's wild. No wonder they make so much. Yeah, they get paid really well, but it's it's you know hazardous hazardous work, and it's definitely a young man's job. It's hard work. They're using big tools and chain falls. And heavy equipment, saws and hammers and big wrenches. It's like a construction site, but underwater. It's <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Just more difficult and dangerous. Yeah. There's a really good video on YouTube of uh, it's an ROV sitting on a pipeline and a diver sitting facing the ROV and the manipulator and the diver are playing tic-tac-toe. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good point, oh, Katachi. Well, to put on the wish list for Herc too, some some kind of uh, automation of the manipulator. I know in Bari's played around with it a little bit. What's on the wish list? A shilling or another craft? Oh, two T fours. Yeah, two shillings. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, we got to be able to compete with the Jasons, the Roposes, and the <laughs> Sebastians of the world. They're all sporting 2T4s. It's an arms race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was really magic watching Jason um, work with both of its T4s midwater around Herc's um, tether to cut it loose. It was just I was absolutely blown away that they could do that with that vehicle. It's so stable. Yeah, it looked like they yeah. were tying a knot. <laughs> they had uh, one of the crew came up with a very clever uh, way to uh, single-handedly put a tie wrap around a, a, a tether. I yeah. heard about that. Yeah, Shia was, that. yeah. <laughs> the thing they did before they cut it? Uh, yeah, I forget why they did it. They were secured. Yeah, they, yeah they, I, I remember seeing that. I forget why they were securing some line they had. Uh, All right, 40 minutes to go, 600 meters. Good timing. Yeah, we've slowed down to, we've been at 13 and 14 and up to 15. Yeah. Looks like you have all your ducks in a row pretty well there, Paul. Yeah. We've still got 600 meters. Well, I think I'll check out. Thank you guys for the dive. I'll go help out on deck. Thanks, Thanks Dwight. Good Dwight. night, Dwight. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Dwight. Dwight. We should bump that craft once. Mm. Oh yeah, just mm -hmm. toggle the button. Hold the jaws closed. Mm.
<laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Kotachi, you're definitely laughing on SPL right now, by the oh, way. Oh, sorry. You, you need to, like, give some context to your laughter now. Or, or I don't know. Oh, we got some spicy comments in the from the viewers. <laughs> okay, wait. We have to. Um, Fifteen minutes ago, this comment came in. I'm so sorry I didn't see it. Um, what is the current discussion on the comparison of ROVs, um, ROV versus HOV, in terms of the quality of the science collected, observed, or observed? When does um, HOV outperform ROV? Hmm. I don't even know what HOV is. I'm sorry. Uh, human occupied vehicle. Ah. I don't know if there's really a comparison from what I've heard. I've never uh, been subseeing one, but the, I've heard that the experience is phenomenal. That it, it, it's not comparable from a you know looking out the window at stuff versus looking through a camera at a at a two D. Yeah, so one of our other um, Herc pilots, Bob Waters, has spent a lot of time operating the HOVs. and um, 20 years as an Alvin pilot. Yeah, pretty incredible. And uh, I think a lot of the value comes from that immersive experience. So, you know, if, if you need to get that scientist down there to, to physically see something or get that intuition, sometimes that can be beneficial. I think in general, because we don't have to worry about humans, we're able to do a lot of dives, do them for longer, um, and take a lot of samples. Uh, so in, in some ways, maybe the ROV is more efficient. Uh, Alvin can take quite a few samples as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I've, I've had the opportunity to go down once in Alvin, and I have to say that the science really is, is probably better achieved with ROVs in basically any measurable way. Uh, but there is definitely something to be said to like this sort of just human element of going down there and seeing things firsthand. Um, it really is like nothing else. And right, we get the same question with space exploration, right? We can do everything with robots or we can try to do everything with astronauts. And um, I think at the end of the day, <laughs> my vote is always make sure that we're funding science well enough to do both. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Excellent answer, Paul. <laughs> Both. Yeah. 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 <laughs> maybe maybe drones first to scout it out. Well, and there's, I mean, I think um, robots are great for the things that humans could never do. I mean, there's a lot of one-way trips to amazing destinations in our solar system that you could never send a human to, and or you could never afford to like send enough fuel to send the human back. But um, that being said, Alvin and Pisces were roaming the depths uh, before ROV could even break oh yeah. uh, four digits in depth and yeah. operation. So Alvin, the the s original sphere for Alvin was made in 1964. Wow. And the Pisces vehicles were roaming around Endeavour in the 70s when an ROV couldn't barely get past 300 meters. Yeah. But was the was the bottleneck computing? Or was it something else? Uh, I, I think, I, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, both, you know, just uh, making all the components that are pressure tolerant and right, the ability right. to control them and the telemetry system, definitely. Yeah, like even Hercules' telemetry system was state of the art 20 years ago, and now it's, you know, it's like. There's not too many 20-year-old laptops and computers that are still operating. Right. <laughs> there are, but, you know, if you look at uh, one, one, one of the great, well, yeah, one of the great analogies is the, my phone has more computing power than the entire space shuttle, right? Right. Yeah. But, so that a lot of people say that if we had never, if we were to go to the moon the first time now, we would send a drone and not humans. Um, yeah, w we only did that, did it the other way around then because we didn't have the computers t to do it. But, I mean, that's that's not to say there's no place for the humans, 
I think humans are like really valuable for the closer look aspect, but yeah. to first scout out if it's safe or not and find out first um, first pieces of information, ROVs and drones are probably safer extensions of our um, exploration. I know one of the other things that gets talked about too is just inspiring young people to go into STEM and um, that human element uh, that sense of exploration and pushing the frontier um, definitely helps some people connect with the field and be motivated. So, so yeah. would Apollo 13 have made it back if there was no humans aboard? <laughs> What's that? Would Apollo 13 have made it back if there were no humans aboard? We also get the question too, like what what we're doing now, sitting here, could be more efficient with an no, autonomous I think, vehicle. So. I think we need the human eyes for what we do. Like yeah. I don't, I really don't think you could automate this. I think you could maybe automate like the arm movement <laughs> yeah. or something. Uh, but so I went uh, years ago. I went out. We uh, had a uh, Embari and their AUV yeah. aboard. And uh, we were doing all the meet and greet in the beginning, and one of the guys introduced himself as an AUV pilot. And I said, man, that's got to be the coolest job in the world. You're a pilot of an autonomous vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I was just joking, and he got all defensive. Well, you have to program it. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm like, Come on, dude, I'm joking. But <laughs> I, w I would say, like, professional babysitter. Then. Yeah. <laughs> I like, uh, I mean, Hercules is piloted and operated by a, you know, specialized learning system. Yeah. It's just a human. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, one of the coolest cruises ever, though, that the AUV, um, they would spend all day working on that thing, and, um, uploading its mission and doing all this testing to make sure that it actually didn't take off and head for the hills, uh, which it did once. And uh, anyways, it would go and it would map all night and we would get these beautiful maps and we'd uh, dive the next day and we discovered uh, several new structures around Endeavor on that mm. cruise. It was uh, pretty awesome to... Yeah, I mean, even this, right, like, we're not underwater, but we have to keep this entire ship out here. You know, our, our endurance is 40 days max. Mm -hmm. um, if you could have some AUVs, you know, mapping and, and getting that data, you know, then it helps everyone else be more efficient. So, they're, I mean, same kind of answer is between humans and ROVs. I'd say the same thing as AUVs and ROVs you want. You want it all. Drix is supposed to be able to go, I think, for seven days. Who, who is writing these comments? We're not supposed to acknowledge. This is anonymous. I don't know. So we're coming up on uh, 250 meters now, so. So I noticed the ship is heading, uh, yeah, east, kind of matching the surface current. Um, we're lined up pretty well behind it. I might take off my laterals a little bit. Um, what are the other things that you're looking for at this kind of stage? What's the... Uh What's the current on the DP doing? What's that say? Uh, Can you read how fast it's going? Yeah, one knot. Oh, yeah, right, one knot. One knot? Uh, on the bow? Yeah, pretty close. I'll also um, I'll look at the bubbles and see if that makes sense, right? Is the ship thrusting forward all the time or mm. the jet pump? So I, gr I ground truth that because that model is not 100%. So 
So is the jet pump thrusting to the side all the time or thrusting forward? So you get an idea if that is uh, reality or not. Can I take off my laterals at this point or is that a bad idea? No, you should yeah. take off your laterals now if our, our timing is, uh, are we going to make it? 23 minutes. Yeah. I might actually be a little late. Hmm. Uh, let's start, let's stream the ship at half a knot just to make it, it'll be easier for you if we're. Roger that. Bridge, this is Nev. Can we please move the sh ship forward at uh, 0.3 knots? And I'm assuming Mark is out and about somewhere, but we should have air on the tuggers and all that stuff by now. Yep. Just want to confirm that uh, tanks are secured and air, air tuggers are in enabled. Copy. Confirm what? But nothing. <laughs> okay. Uh. At what point is it considered that you have reached the thermocline, Ryan? Yeah, so the thermocline is the uh, area of the upper ocean where the temperature changes rapidly. Uh, it really depends where you are, um, and it can even vary seasonally. So if you're um, in an area where the water column is really well mixed, like say you're in a, a really high intense current like the Gulf Stream, you might not even have a thermocline because the water is really well mixed down to pretty deep depths. Um, but typically when you're coming up, say the last 100 meters or so, um, you can see the temperature changes relatively quickly from, um, and that's what a thermocline is. It means just a steep incline of temperature. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I wonder, did, did anybody see if there's anyone in the lounge right now? And to be a tagline for Argus, do you go full speed ahead or? Yeah, pin it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll walk you through it again. Right there. It's, doesn't happen that fast, so it should be yeah. all right. Yeah. The weather's calm, that's the main thing. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's lose the comment page now, Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, we need to focus up here. So, so I don't, would prefer not to have the distraction while we're recovering. And so now that the ship is streaming ahead, like the uh, the current data on that screen is going to be. Yeah, it's going like to be wonky now. Yeah. 
but that should give you and has a, a couple a bit of a boost in um, your ascent rate. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I have to adjust the wind speed here a little. I'll pay a little closer attention to the delta just to make sure we're not outside the box too far. And so then at 50 meters, do we come to a stop? Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, no, the ship doesn't. No, we'll keep the ship no, no, I mean, all the way I to... I mean, us, like, or er, on her for the ascent. Like, keep driving forward, but pause the ascent, or they just switch it to a... Uh, Main deck, this is control, radio check. They'll, um... They just swap this. They'll swap that, yeah. I see Mark out there just now, Katachi, he's probably going to, it'll take him uh, five minutes or so to get the deck set up. Roger. Just start to see the uh, the peeps out there. Hopefully they'll get the crane sorted out. Uh, probably take your head off now, Paul. It's what do you mean by that? The you're <coughs> so by driving ahead, you're hmm. you're uh, got it. See the angle of your wire there, and the wire cam. You're pulling it out. Um, hmm. If you want, just uh, just for safety, you can click in auto heading. That way, for some reason, they get close together, it won't. But um, we really want to keep an eye on the uh, aft cams because we can and have uh, lose a compass or a thruster, mm. and it'll start spinning circles. Got it. And if you don't catch it, it's it could be it, it could be bad. <laughs> Okay, we have a question. Um, we were talking about um, this area has high density but low diversity, um, mostly fan carls. Do high density and low diversity mostly go together? Right. Yeah, so that's a good question. It really depends. Um, so we've been lucky enough on a, a bunch of dives this expedition to see high density and high diversity. Uh, I think it just has been variable seamount by seamount. We see a different community structure really at each one. And today's seamount, Argonaut seamount, happened to have a uh, really high density of hemichorallium and chrysogorgid corals for a lot of it. And uh, for parts of it, it was like mostly just dominated by those two. So like most questions in biology, it's often just, it depends. Thank you, Ryan. I just want to uh, give a command on the boxes to make sure they're shut tight there before we come into the warm water. Yeah, I'm going to turn off it. 
parts. So, uh, and uh, do we need to? I'm gonna move this thing over into the front there so it doesn't uh, It kind of sticks out to the side and it hurt, hurts a little nose heavy, so it lands, lands uh, on the magnum sometimes. If I can find the right button. Still tail to tail at. Yeah. Some verticals. It's interesting here, pulling off to the south there. Let's Um, take off your forward. Maybe that's what's, uh, take off the forward and the auto heading for a minute. Yeah, maybe that's what's pulling it around there. I think the auto heading was once thrusting forward, once thrusting backwards, and it was walking it over sideways. See if you can uh, lateral back. Otherwise, we'll change the track, but I think that's what was doing it. Like, why is it going south? Yep, that's... Yeah, sorry, you gotta watch that too if it if you see one red line up and the other down, it's not happy and it's fighting, which causes it to go pear shape. So we're coming into the warmer water now, and uh, you all also want to watch your uh, motor temp and the res, because you're giving her the beans now to... No, I keep keep going. It's, it's something to be aware of, right? I think they might have, they cut in that hatch, may have got whacked or something, they cut it off and then they, they can't have a 
watertight hatch removed. <laughs> I'm going to weld it back on. Is that one of the vents for the DP fans? Roger. Yeah, let's come off them and see what happens. Mark's ran them all off. Mark ran all the that grew up. Hard hats and life jackets. As we get closer to the surface, I just want to say mahalo to everyone who's been tuning in for this dive and following us along. Uh, and we'll be commentating and narration will probably end very soon so that we can leave the air open for the deck crew and our ROV pilots here to communicate. Mahalo kako. Pomalie. Pomalie. Ekala hui. We'll see you in the morning. Yep. 8 a.m. Yeah, is our next dive. 8 a.m. HST. Yep. We didn't get to do dad jokes. Oh, yeah. Did I write any down? It's okay. We don't have to do some now. Yep, we've we'll we'll got them for tomorrow. We've got three, for tomorrow. Yeah. three hours of blue water to pull out our dad jokes. <laughs> Main deck control, winch is at 50 meters. Understood, all stop, five zero. We okay to recover? Not too good. Do that. Bridge main deck, radio check. Main deck bridge, loud and clear. Are we okay to recover? Bridges go for recovery. Coming up.